Okay, my name is John Long. I'm a faculty member here at ChemH uh, in the Department of Pathology. And it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our final speaker of this wonderful symposium. Uh, he is an individual who does not need any introduction, Peter Kim. Uh, Peter, of course, is a product of Stanford. He received his PhD here uh, with Buzz Baldwin in the Department of Biochemistry. Uh, over the subsequent several decades of work in science, uh, Peter has just had an absolutely illustrious career. Uh, he was president at Merck, where he actually developed uh, many, many medicines, including, as Carolyn mentioned, Gardasil, uh, and also in my field, Genuvia, which is just an amazing diabetes medicine. Uh, since coming back to Stanford uh, 10 years ago, Peter has been uh, really at the forefront of vaccine development. And um, just on a personal note, uh, you know, it's been really great to have Peter as a, as a colleague here and also someone who I consider as a mentor. Uh, it's been wonderful as a junior faculty member to see someone uh, who has done so much in science and also to see someone who's so uh, personal and uh, responsive to emails from me. <laughs> so thank you, Peter. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Peter here to give us um, his lecture, Broad Spectrum Protection Treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, John. It, this, is, uh, this is just fantastic after 10 years. Um, where's Chayton? He decided not to come to my talk. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not here, huh? <laughs> nice. <laughs> we started this, uh, yeah, 10 years ago, and um, Chayton and Carolyn uh, and I and Chris Walsh, uh, and it's really been an amazing ride. And I want to thank Chayton, even though he didn't come to my talk, <laughs> for being uh, the most selfless leader that I know. Uh, really, I mean that. He is the most selfless leader that I know. And I want to thank Carolyn for taking on the baton and carrying us forward. It's just been a remarkable uh, ride. It's been remarkable, the people that we've been able to recruit uh, to this institute and just the promise of what's uh, coming forward. It's, it's just so exciting. Um, I want to talk today about two topics. One is treating SARS-CoV-2, and the other is preventing SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is the problem statement for the first part of my talk. There have been many drugs that have been developed, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars spent developing them, clinical trials galore. As of today, there are no monoclonal antibody treatments that are emergency use authorized by the FDA for treating SARS-CoV-2. Fortunately, there are remarkable drugs. Paxlovid is helping a lot. But still, in the United States alone, as of uh, last month, there are 4,000 people per week that are hospitalized for SARS-CoV-2. And of course, the fear is that if something uh, goes out of control again, we're not going to have monoclonal antibody treatments to treat people who are hospitalized. Uh, there are many conserved parts of the region of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, but all the antibodies target what's called the RBD, or the receptor binding domain. And that part is pulled out on the right-hand side of the figure. And the mutations in Omicron you see are in red. And of course, if you make antibodies against the most important part of the, of the protein, of the virus, uh, then the antibodies will uh, develop to protect against that. There, uh, Eric Waltering and Peyton Weidenbacher, early in the pandemic, went onto the public database of antibodies and using bioinformatics and then yeast display, pulled out antibodies that bound to highly conserved parts of SARS-CoV-2. And our hope was that some of these would be neutralizing and thereby give broader neutralizing activity, which were less susceptible to antibody uh, inhibition. And it turned out we failed, as did every other company and every other group that tried to do this. It's really, so far, been not possible to find antibodies which bind to highly conserved regions of the CoV-2 protein that are also inhibitory. But Peyton, uh, being the person that he is, decided to turn lemonade into lem lemon into lemonade, lemons into lemonade by saying, hey, if we take the conserved antibodies which bind to those epitopes and we tether them to ACE2 that binds to the receptor binding domain, then we have a way of having something which is 
uh, able to bind to all CoV2 variants, and because the uh, ACE2 domain is at high effective concentration, maybe it'll inhibit everything. And uh, to facilitate his control experiment, he inserted a TEV site so he could proteolize it. And sure enough, <clears throat> when he made these uh, constructs from different antibodies, uh, they inhibited against uh, a wide variety of viruses. When he treated with TEV, uh, now they no longer inhibited. Uh, but as you can see with Omicron, and this was the early days of Omicron with BA1, starting to lose some activity here, 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 here. And so we weren't perfect. And so Ashley Utz took on the task of trying to make it per perfect. And the goal was to uh, keep, we, 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 we went through a lot of discussion about this, but we decided to keep the ACE2 here. And the reason is the one thing the virus needs to do, no matter what it does, it can mutate, it can mutate like crazy, but it's got to bind ACE2. Okay. And so we decided to keep ACE2 and not go for a super binder or a monoclonal antibody, but instead say, we're going to make sure it binds ACE2 because that's what the virus has to do. But we need a better antibody here, which is going to uh, be more effective against anything that we could possibly see. And together with Camille Brewer in uh, Bill Robinson's lab, who had published on uh, antibodies from people that had been immunized with the uh, Pfizer vaccine and pulled on antibodies, Ashley has been able to identify an antibody that actually binds to all of the human coronaviruses that in all of the coronaviruses that infect humans, including the common cold coronaviruses, as well as MERS, SARS-2, and SARS-1. So now we have an antibody component which binds to every known uh, human coronavirus, and it's tethered to ACE2. And when you look at it now, inhibition uh, against the latest problem child, which is XBB.1.5, it's 0.1 nanomolar efficacy. And so together with Adrian uh, Hugenmotter, who's been a wonderful partner at the IMA, we're now advancing this and hoping that we're going to be able to actually turn this into something which could be uh, sitting on the shelf ready to go, regardless of what comes along next. Uh, now to preventing uh, COVID-2. This is the problem statement for this part of the talk. Uh, thank goodness for mRNA vaccines. That's why we're here. Uh, but there are many parts of the world where, in fact, uh, people have not been vaccinated at all. And I like to say now that even if one doesn't have a single humanitarian cell in one's body, Omicron, which undoubtedly they think now developed in an unimmunized individual in Africa, uh, shows you that even if you have no philanthropic uh, humanitarian uh, bones, uh, that this is in your selfish interest to help solve this problem on this, on this slide. Uh, we decided to approach this by using particles because particles are taken up well by dendritic cells and then they bring them to the lymph nodes where they then ultimately lead to receptor clustering of B cells and better immunogenicity that way. And uh, I won't go through this in detail, but what we did was to put it onto ferritin. And the NIH had shown uh, a while ago that this is a wonderful... Uh, platform. There's a nice threefold axis of symmetry on these ferritin particles, and uh, they're well suited for putting the trimeric spike protein onto it. They originally did it with hemagglutinin. What we did was to take the SARS CoV 2 spike and to put it on this threefold axis of symmetry. This is the cryo EM structure that we determined together with uh, Wa Chu's lab, and it shows the eight trimers, so eight times three equals 24, which is the 24 ferritins that are on there. Uh, these partic these uh, spike trimers are very nicely spaced to lead to good receptor clustering. But importantly, one thing we did was to delete the last 70 residues of the ectodomain, the last 70 residues that are immediately adjacent to this membrane. And the reason we did that is that uh, Joe DeRissi and his coworkers, and then later others, showed that those 70 residues are highly immunogenic in COVID patients. They lead to antibodies strongly against those, that region, but those antibodies are against linear epitopes and they're non-neutralizing. So it's what Mark Davis has started calling a distractope, right? This is something that leads to an immune response, but actually is counterproductive. And we showed that indeed uh, both the formation of the particle was really helpful and deletion of these 70 residues was helpful. as uh, part of the vaccine moving forward. 
Since then, what we did was to incorporate uh, an additional four prolines that Jason McClellan's lab introduced to make things more stable and express better. This is now the uh, cryo-EM structure of the HEXAPRO version, as it's called, that Stephen Tong uh, uh, determined. And so our final version here is called Delta C70, removing those 70 residues, ferritin HEXAPRO. And that's what we're going to now move forward with. And this is the summary of where we are with the vaccine. First of all, we have a stable, uh, suitable formulation, which is safe for use in adults and children, including infants. Uh, it's secondly, as has always been our goal, affordable worldwide access. Third is room temperature stability. And fourth is durable and highly efficacious protection against all COVID-2 uh, variants so far. Uh, the only adjuvant that we're using in this vaccine is called alum. And alum is an ancient adjuvant that's been used over 90 years. It is used in infant vaccines. So the day a baby is born, he or she is immunized with hepatitis B antigen formulated in alum. Okay, every baby gets that. And then they go, go on to get uh, additional uh, uh, vaccines in, in, uh, in, in, in alum. And there's been a lot of discussion and controversy around what you do with immunization of uh, children and babies. And this, uh, we think, offers the potential to have a protein-based vaccine in alum, in buffer, to inject into uh, babies as we move forward. Also, uh, it's uh, generic, so it's inexpensive. Affordable worldwide access, thanks to the philanthropy that Stanford Development Office was able to get for me, we were able to establish a uh, cell line under what's called good manufacturing practice conditions. Uh, and basically what they do is to take uh, a proprietary leapin transposase technology to insert into a CHO cell line at specific uh, uh, 60 or more loci in specific locations to create cell lines that produce uh, the protein in large amounts. We then take each of these bars as a different cell line that we screened. And we screen them for the amount of protein production. And as you can see, we ended up with a cell line that produces over two grams per liter, which means that we have now the ability to make tens of thousands of doses per liter. And the manufacturing experts tell me that at that level, the cost of making the protein is less than the cost of, of the vial, the syringe, and the needle, which is good. That's where we want to be, right? Uh, and uh, now to room temperature stability. We formulated this vaccine with alum and then let it sit. And in this case, we let it sit for two weeks at either 4 degrees, 27 degrees, or 37 degrees C. And then we tested the immunogenicity. And as you can see, we're stable for at least two weeks at 37 degrees C. So the idea is that with this vaccine, we should be able to ship it, presumably uh, without freezing, but we can ship it uh, refrigerated to wherever it needs to go. And then, even in warm climates, you now have two weeks to distribute it to, to people that need it. Right. And then, what about efficacy? Does this thing actually work? Right. Well, uh, there now are a lot of studies uh, from different vaccine trials that show that uh, and the rule seems to be holding pretty well, that if you have a pseudovirus tissue culture ID50 of 100, that is, you take the serum and you dilute it 100-fold, and that's your IC50 in tissue culture for a particular viral strain, say Omicron. Then, uh, when you run the clinical trial, your vaccine efficacy is 90% against that strain, okay, so against that particular strain. So 10 to the 2 is the magic number that you want. You want to have uh, a viral uh, titer in tissue culture of 10 to the 2. And what we see is that when we go into rhesus macaques with our vaccine, we're getting titers of 10 to the 4.4. So we're orders of magnitude higher than we need to be. And this is actually orders of magnitude higher than what we get with uh, the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines as well. And because we're so high to start off with, we can take the hits that one takes, and you do take hits, as you go to Omicron, uh, BA4.5, BA. 1.1, and not shown on here, but we've done now as well, XBB.1.5, and we're still uh, in the 10 to 2.7 or so range. So we're in the place where we're still going to have greater than 90% vaccine efficacy if monkeys are, if pe people are like monkeys, which we'll see. Importantly, we also have activity against SARS-1, and that's exciting because that's in a completely different leg of the pharmaco, of the uh, phylogenetic uh, tree. But perhaps 
even more exciting is that we have durability. Okay, this notion that we have to go back, or at least if you're old like me, you have to go back every three months and get another shot is, is just crazy, right? And here, what you see is this, with this vaccine in, in monkeys, you get a nice rise in the titer, and then you get a decrease, as, this is what you see with, good, with vaccines, but then you get a plateauing, okay? And that plateau lasts for a year. And we've also shown now that if we boost after a year, we get a very strong anamnestic response, and it's again restored. So we think we've got minimally a once a year vaccine, and maybe even, maybe, a once and done vaccine for boosting, okay, as, as we move forward. So where are we? Uh, I didn't put my disclosure slide in. Disclosure. I, I had, I had to do it. I had to do it in order to get this across the uh, finish line. Uh, it's been licensed by Stanford and Biohub to a company which I'm involved with called Vaccine Company. Uh, this has potential as a once yearly or less frequent broad spectrum COVID-19 vaccine, either for previously vaccinated and or for previously infected individuals. In fact, the company is planning to do trials in the United States, which will be previously vaccinated, and excitingly in South Africa at the South African MRC, which will be previously infected but non-vaccinated non folks. So we'll see what this looks like as a booster for people who haven't been vaccinated before, but have 99% uh, of them have been infected. And the South African government is so excited about this that they've bought Pfizer vaccine to give to us to run as a comparator. Okay. Uh, it's ideally suited for pediatric vaccination. You know, there's a lot of talk about what's called, what was originally, what used to be called original antigenic sin, and people didn't like that name, so now they call it immune imprinting. But basically, it goes back, some of the best studies were done with the 1918 flu. If you got the 1918 flu or, or thereafter, your immune response to flu subsequently was very different than people who did not. And that's because it depends what, it matters what you first get immunized with against a virus. And we think that this is the best thing to give to an infant because this will set up a broad spectrum activity against all of the different variants. And so this notion of doing bivalent vaccination and chasing variants and all this, no, 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 time out. Let's do a good priming of the infants, okay? And so, uh, especially since this is an alum, we think this is ideally suited for pediatric vaccination. Our goal, and we're not there yet, but our goal working with this company, National Resilience, uh, is to provide this ultimately at a dollar per dose. We want to be able to manufacture that, this vaccine for the rest of the world at a dollar per dose. We'll charge you guys a lot more than that, but, but, but around the world to be able to do that for a dollar a dose will make a huge difference. We have a part, uh, Stanford has set up a partnership with this company called National Resilience. They've agreed to produce the material through clinical proof of concept. And as I said, uh, uh, I'm involved with the company now and uh, I just got the email today. They're gonna start, uh, First injection is tomorrow, University of Maryland. And so that's the bottle right there, getting ready to go. Uh, these are, this, this uh, vaccine project has been a tremendous effort with many people at Stanford and the University of Kansas, at IAVI, University of Louisiana, and the California Department of Public Health, which I didn't show you their data with live virus. Uh, these four people are really the heroes in uh, this work. Even though it was a huge effort, they really carried uh, out the majority of the work. I have to thank the uh, Frank Quattrone and Denise Federo uh, Family Research Fund. Without their uh, uh, generous philanthropy, we wouldn't have been able to push this project forward the way we did. The IMA has been a critical piece of this, as has uh, uh, Chan Zuckerberg and Iavi. And f uh, for the rest of the work, I talked about Ashley and the rest of the folks who have been involved in this, but I've just got this tremendous group of people that are involved in all sorts of different projects, but I wanted to focus today on COVID. So thank you, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Oh, very exciting talk, thank you very much. Um, when you showed the uh, neutralizing titers, um, it seemed like you were pretty close to that uh, 10 to the second cutoff, yep. and you also mentioned um, imprinting at the end. Is there any plan to perhaps shift to the currently circulating um, variants because the wild type one just doesn't exist anymore? Great question. Um, the notion that you can just shift these variants and go chasing the latest one is, we think, uh, somewhat flawed in that the stability and the characteristics of the new variants 
are act it's actually less stable and more and more floppy. And so it's not clear that if you prime with that, you're going to get protection against some of the earlier versions or variants thereof. So our approach to what you're suggesting, which is a very important thing, how do you prepare for the future, is actually to try to come up with um, another coronavirus uh, spike. And we're particularly interested in SARS-1 and MERS as a potential uh, component to add as a second component. To be complete, we'll also test it against uh, one of the more recent SARS-CoV-2 variants. And these experiments, we'll see, we're, we're trying to set up to do these experiments in humans, which is where it matters. Uh, but, you know, there are logistical and financial issues with that. Uh, at, at a minimum, we need to do the experiments uh, pre, uh, in animals to, to answer that. But I think what would be a dream is if you could use this as your base SARS-CoV-2 and now come in with, say, MERS. And we know that we've got this much space with, with what we have here. Maybe we get this with, with MERS and be prepared for something that we've never seen before, right? Uh, but that, it's, a, it's an important question. And figuring out the answer to that is going to be important because you don't want to have a, you don't want to keep constantly changing this. You want to have something that's good, good for, for life, right? Yes? Uh, first off, great talk. Um, so the mRNA vaccines, I would say, rather surprisingly, induced a little bit of mucosal immunity. Uh, does this vaccine induce mucosal immunity? And related, uh, like, what do you think about mucosal immunity in with respect to sterilizing uh, transmission? Right. Uh, I don't know the answer to your first question. We didn't get that much philanthropy, uh, but uh, it's 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 an important question uh, to evaluate. Uh, in response to the second question, though. There, there's been, there was a lot of hype, especially about a year ago, about you know nasal sprays and stuff to induce mucosal immunity. Uh, the best available evidence so far, and it's still not definitive, is that the degree of, of uh, mucosal immunity in your nose is correlated with the levels of serum antibodies in parenteral vaccines. So because our levels of neutralizing antibodies are so high, we're quite confident that we're going to be good at the mucosal level. But we haven't demonstrated that, to be, to be fair. But what's also not happened is there hasn't been a mucosal approach which has sort of knocked it out of the water. And so I think this, we're, we're sort of hearing less and less about that. All right, great. And with that, great. let's give Peter a final round Thank of you. applause. Thank you. Peter.